first time in nearly 40 years, Peugeot has bought us a small car that really pushes the boundaries in Super Mini design. This second generation 208 model's engineering may not quite be unique, but all the feel-good stuff really is. The pavement presence, the avant-garde cabin. Plus, that's been delivered with most of the practicality and efficiency you'll need from a small hatch. Here's a car that's made other brands in its sector really sit up and take notice. And, we think, quite a few buyers who'd never normally choose a Peugeot in this class are going to do the same. If you're going to design a really groundbreaking super mini, say one that could be produced on the same production line with either petrol, diesel or full electric powertrains, shouldn't it make a fashion statement as well as an engineering one? Well, as you can see, this car does. Welcome to the second generation Peugeot 208. We've never had to talk about generations with Peugeot Super Minis before because they've always been badged differently ever since the brand properly established itself in this segment with the much admired 205 back in 1983. Subsequent successive models, the 206 of 1998, the 207 of 2006 and the original 208 of 2012 were less appealing but still sold well. But that odd evolving numerical naming convention wasn't great for building model line loyalty, which is why the brand has put a stop to it. Or perhaps they just don't own the rights to 209 and 210. Who can tell? Anyway, it's ironic that this Mark II Model 208, launched late in 2019, keeps its name because it's easily the most fundamentally radical and different small Persia Super Mini since the 205. Perhaps we should qualify the term different. The CMP common modular platform and all the basic engineering here is, after all, exactly the same as you'll find it in the PSA Group's other most recent small car products, the Vauxhall Corsa and the DS3 Crossback. But even in this company, this Lion branded model manages to stand out. Peugeot's clearly set out its stall here. A Ford Fiesta may sell on price and the way it drives. A Volkswagen Polo may sell on quality and the way it rides. But this Gallic brand is determined that a 208 should sell on style, technology and the way it makes you feel. In a segment otherwise full of contenders all trying to copy those two market leaders, that's rather refreshing. Of course, not everyone likes advanced technology and cutting edge style rarely equates to mass market appeal. On top of that, this car's quite ambitiously priced, especially in the full electric E208 form that Peugeot hopes will account for 20% of sales. Yet it undeniably seems to offer something a little different for small car buyers. Different isn't always better, but it might be here. Let's find out. What should a small French family car feel like to drive? Much like this, we think. Peugeot hasn't bothered trying to be sporty, firm and Germanic here. So the damping control is gentle and allows for a bit of chassis movement, but gets firmer when the body starts pitching about, as it will do if you start pushing this car into corners in the kind of way a typical owner never would. Predictably, the resulting confection doesn't give you the alert responses that you get in a Fiesta or even in a Renault Clio. But for the kind of urban driving that cars of this sort tend to do, we think it's pretty well judged. What it lacks in handling finesse is well compensated for by the languid and properly Gallic way the car handles speed humps and tarmac tears. Your first impressions from rest are that everything's very light, principally the clutch and the steering. Thankfully, the helm weights up quite a bit the faster you go, though not always with the kind of consistency we'd ideally want. The PSA Group really needs to poach some Ford engineers to help its products with steering feel. If that were ever to happen, you get the feeling that it would be possible to feel really quite connected to this car, given the way that the curious eye cockpit dash setup's tiny wheel allows for lovely wrist flick cornering movements. 
Using it requires the usual curious need to view the instrument dials above the wheel rim rather than through the wheel spokes. And once you've adjusted to this, it's difficult not to be initially slightly distracted by the clever 3D digital instrument cluster, which is meant to improve your reaction times, but initially will probably have the opposite effect. The other key thing you'll probably notice on early acquaintance with this car is how relatively refined it is, by super many standards anyway. Yes, even if you opt for the kind of combustion engine model that we're trying here. If you're familiar with any of the hype surrounding this car, or if you viewed other sections of this film, you'll know that it can also be ordered in full electric E208 form. We'll get to that after we've covered off the petrol and diesel variants that more 208 customers will be able to choose. Since only 1 in 20 208 buyers will want to fuel from the black pump, the main focus with this Mark II model is this car's petrol PureTech unit, a revy little three-cylinder engine we always rather liked in the previous generation model. Its carryover here meant that Peugeot could divert development funds towards trendy design and that full EV variant that we just mentioned. There's no part electrification of this petrol unit of the mild hybrid kind that Ford has now implemented into the EcoBoost unit used in a competing Fiesta. This 208's PureTech engine doesn't quite have the characterful thrum of that rival power plant either, though it'll still fizz happily up to the red line if you find yourself running late and need to gun it a bit. Yes, even if you've limited yourself to the base normally aspirated 75 horsepower version, which feels eager to rev but is ultimately way down on pulling power thanks to the lack of a turbo to push things along. As a result, in a PureTech 75 spec 208, you'll need to make plenty of use of the five-speed gearbox you have to have with this base unit. And even if you do, 62 miles an hour takes a lengthy 14.9 seconds to reach from rest, en route to a modest maximum of 106 miles an hour. All of which explains why the vast majority of 208 buyers bargain their way up into the turbocharged 100 horsepower version of this petrol engine that we're trying here. It's a great little lump, which as you'd expect courtesy of the turbo, delivers much more of a shove from low revs, with nearly double the amount of pulling power. There's also a lovely warble as it goes about its business, which is notably more uh, restrained here than it is in a comparable Vauxhall Corsa. The drive mode button on the centre console um, promises more than it delivers, just normal and eco settings. Uh, the latter being a mode that you'll need to stay away from if you want to get anywhere close to the quoted performance stats for this power plant. 62 miles an hour in 9.9 .9 seconds on the way to 117 miles an hour. This PureTech 100 unit is the only engine in the range that gives you a choice of transmissions. Either this six-speed manual or a really rather sophisticated auto with no fewer than eight speeds, steering wheel paddles and extra sport and manual drive modes. Use of that auto transmission is mandatory with the 130 horsepower version of the 1.2 litre petrol unit also available in this car. The performance stats for that engine are 62 miles an hour in 8.7 seconds en route to 129 miles an hour. We can't really see much of a motivation to pay the substantial premium Peugeot wants for the only other engine on offer, a 1.5 litre Blue HDI 100 diesel, even though that 100 horsepower unit is class leadingly clean and economical. We suppose it might be more suitable in the unlikely event that you were planning to do something like tow a small caravan behind your 208, but even in that scenario you might note that the 1.2 ton brake towing capacity of this diesel is no different from that of the turbo petrol unit. The performance figures are very similar too, 62 miles an hour from rest occupying 10.2 seconds en route to 117 miles an hour. That's covered off what Peugeot likes to call its thermic powertrain options. As mentioned earlier, there is another power plant to talk about, that E208 model's fully battery powered setup. Here, as with this model's cousin, the Vauxhall Corsa E, a 50 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery is mated to a 100 kilowatt electric motor, putting out 136 brake horsepower and working through the usual single speed auto transmission that you get with EVs. 
Like all electric vehicles, this one develops all of its torque at once. There's 260 newton meters of it, and this car simply hurls itself away from rest. It takes just a couple of seconds to crest the 30 mile an hour mark, and 62 miles an hour is reached in only 8.1 seconds, disguising the fact that, also like all EVs, this zero emission variant has a bit of a weight problem. That drivetrain adds over 300 kilograms of bulk. That other small battery powered little hatches manage this issue a little better is evidenced by the fact that the E208's WLTP rated 211 mile driving range is easily improved upon by the latest versions of the Renault Zoe and the BMW i3. Still, all of this does represent a brave new world for forward thinking super mini buyers looking to make the still rather expensive switch into all electric motoring. It seems like only yesterday, after all, that a fully charged small EV could only manage around half the kind of range you get from this one. Of course, you certainly won't achieve anything like that kind of operating capability if you get anywhere near this EV's quoted 93 mile an hour top speed, or if you habitually drive your E208 in the sport setting that'll be necessary to release uh, the full 136 brake horsepower power output just mentioned right down to 83 brake horsepower. That's the setting you'll use in an E208 around town, an environment in which it makes a strange polyphonic sound at low speeds to warn unwary pedestrians of its impending approach. Above 18 miles an hour, all you can hear is a bit of tyre roar from the eco-moulded Michelin rubber. Our focus today though is on combustion powered 208 models and if yours is too we think that you'll find plenty to like here particularly if your definition of driving enjoyment lies with a lowering rather than a raising of the heartbeat or if you're the kind of person who wants to have as little input into the road going experience as possible. Should that be the case you might potentially be interested in the limited level 2 style driving autonomy that it's possible to build into plusher versions of this car. With this, a combination of adaptive cruise control and a lane positioning assist system mean that on a long highway trip virtually all the steering, braking and throttle work would be done for you. It's just another example of the way that Super Mini design has moved forward from a small car packaged in a way proving that beyond doubt. Peugeot has quite a history in small hatches stretching back to the 104 of 1976 but perhaps more pertinently in terms of B-segment super minis the 205 of 1983. Since then, the brand has accumulated over 22 million sales in this segment without ever delivering anything that was particularly memorable. But that stops right here, right now. If you want this 208, it'll be because you think it looks like nothing else on the road. And you'll be right. The front end is probably the most immediately arresting part of the design with these distinctive LED corner fangs that on GT line models flow up into the three claw LED headlight signature. Look further up and you'll note the paired back windscreen that allows space for this larger sculpted bonnet, the forward tip of which shows off the 208 badge. The front bumper is designed as a single contour incorporating a central waterfall style convex surfaced radiator grille bearing the Peugeot line. The all electric E208 is distinguished from what Peugeot calls thermic powered models by the adoption of body colouring for this grille and a more unusual dichronic finish for the line badge that appears to change colour depending on your viewing angle. At the rear, the avant-garde theme continues with exact design and tautly drawn shaping. The 3D tail lamps feature that three claw signature and are linked by a black band running the width of the boot lid, emphasising this second generation 208 model's extra width. This rear diffuser features this gloss black finish and can be enhanced by a chromed exhaust tailpipe.
We think it all looks particularly good if you ignore the darker colours. We've got nearer black here and specify one of the brighter shades, maybe Faro Yellow, the only standard colour, or perhaps the more expensive Elixir Red or Triple Coat Vertigo Blue finishes. In profile, things are a touch more conventional, though if you're familiar with the previous generation model, you'll immediately notice this squared off C-pillar, which is a nod to the old 205 model and has these curious recessed indentations. And you might also note just how much larger and lower this current car is, with its wide wings and curvier body. There's no three-door version this time round, so the designers have tried to make this five-door body shape slightly sportier, with little touches like the way this angled quarter light is perfectly aligned with the rear wheel arch. Wheel sizes are either 16 inches or, as in this case, 17 inches, and the GT Lion and GT series models, recognisable by the diamond black roof colouring that features with these top trim levels, feature glossy black wheel arch flares, which streamline the body, making the wheel diameter appear larger. On these premium versions, the wheel rims are adorned with screw-in customizable inserts, which improve the aerodynamics and apparently reduce curb weight by 3.6 kilograms. Of course, the major contribution to the reduction of curb weight lies with the way the vehicle platform is structured, and in this regard, this Peugeot starts out with a big advantage, thanks to its use of the sophisticated CMP, that's Common Modular Platform chassis, we've already seen in two other recent PSA Group small car products, the DS3 Crossback and the F-Generation Vauxhall Corsa. This chassis is 30 kilograms lighter than the PF1 underpinnings used in the previous model, and as a result of this, an entry-level version of this 208 tips the scales at just 980 kilograms. Some city cars from the class below weigh more than that. The modularity of this platform is what allows the E208 model's full electric powertrain to be built in without any exterior bodywork changes. Peugeot thinks visual familiarity is what the majority of EV buyers want. Volkswagen, which has just launched its standalone ID electric sub-brand, clearly thinks very differently. Right, time to take a look inside. Too often with futuristic looking cars you find the designers have run out of ideas or budget by the time it comes to the interior. Is that the case here? No. In fact, this cabin is in many ways the most innovative part of the car, reminding you just how stuck in a rut most other super minis are in terms of design. Peugeot has been getting us used to this futuristic feel in stages. Their so-called eye cockpit format, where you view the instrument binnacle over the upper rim of a tiny steering wheel rather than conventionally through the wheel spokes, was a feature of the last 208 and continues again here. But this car's fresh interpretation of that design theme, and generally much classier feel, takes things another further step forward and we really like the two-tier fascia layout with its smart carbon-trimmed concave inner section that curls around the edge of the cabin and on into the doors. The key thing your attention will be drawn towards immediately is this 3D instrument binnacle display, which is standard from mid-range trip upwards and was derived from the futuristic setup first seen on the brand's quartz concept car of 2014. This sees critical information like speed projected in hologram form from the inner roof of the binnacle onto a piece of slanted perspex in the foreground. A button on the left of the steering wheel gives you six ways to format this setup, all of which feature fuel and temperature readouts that respectively show at the left and the right hand extremities of the display and feature on a screen set further back. Now, basically, the different modes change what's projected into the middle. Minimum gives you a digital speedo. Dials add to that uh, flanking analog style virtual speedo and rev counter gauges. The driving setting prioritizes a safety graphic. Navigation prioritizes a nav map. Then there are personal one and personal two settings, which add into the center section either trip computer data or a circular rev counter. 
At whatever setting you select, it's all very aircraft cockpit-like. And Peugeot says that the way the data is displayed slightly closer to your eyeline can improve reaction time by up to half a second at motorway speeds. Others mutter about form over function, as they always do with trendy new cabin technology. Peugeot's brand stablemate Citroen used to favour futuristic cabin features like this, then spoil it all with weird dash design and questionable quality. A mistake that stylist Gilles Vidal and his team have successfully avoided making here. In fact, if you like a sophisticated feel, you might well find this to be the most attractive interior in the Super Mini segment. Certainly perceived quality is at the upper end of the kind of thing that you'll find in this class, though much of that relies on acres of shiny piano black plastic that will quickly scratch and smear unless you're extremely careful. As is now usual in any modern car, the centre of the fascia is dominated by an infotainment touchscreen, normally 7 inches in size for 208 buyers, but optionally available in the larger 10-inch form that we have here. The display resolution and response isn't quite as good as you'll find with VW Group products, nor is its menu structure as clear and easy to use. But we like the way that it's subtly angled towards the driver, uh, can be configured in blue, red or green quartz colouring and has a neatly extended part to its lower frame that you can rest your finger on between screen grabs. Plus, as you'd expect, all the important incorporated elements are present and correct. Uh, a decent DAB audio system, uh, Bluetooth and Apple CarPlay Android Auto mirroring for your smartphone. On that subject, quite impressively, virtually all 208s come fitted with a wireless charging mat too. Uh, you have to have this bigger 10-inch monitor to get navigation, Peugeot's very complete connected 3D package, which indicates traffic conditions and risk zones in real time. Plus, with this larger screen, there are specific EV displays in the uh, E208 variant. All of that's welcome, but the inclusion of climate functions on this screen isn't, though some of them can be uh, duplicated to the outside of the display frame. It really feels counterintuitive to have to switch away from whatever you're looking at every time you want to get a screen that allows you to fully change the cabin climate or alter the fan speed. More worryingly, the task requires you to take your eyes away from the road for longer than would otherwise be necessary. The physical controls below this monitor really aren't ideal in this regard either. These seven stylized piano style keys certainly look rather nice, but including a row of touch sensitive icons behind them seems odd. First, because it means you can learn to operate by touch, where only half the things are. And second, because the touch sensitive buttons are easily tapped by mistake when you're using the front keys. Plus, they can collect condensation from the air conditioning. The benefit of not having physical centre stack climate controls, the sort of thing that you do get in this car's Corsa cousin, to be frank isn't huge. The space these would normally occupy is used instead by a smart lidded box, the inner box lid of which has a pen recess and inside of which is the wireless phone charging mat that we referenced earlier. The provision of this compartment does at least mean you can charge your handset out of sight of prying eyes, rather than leaving it exposed in this open area in front of the gear stick, which incorporates a 12 volt socket and which has twin USB ports nearby. The designers have forgotten to add an overhead sunglasses compartment, uh, probably because they wanted to make space for this optional panoramic cielo glass roof, which has ra a rather stiff manual blind. Uh, but there are decently sized door bins with angled bottle holders. Uh, you get a small open cubby by the driver's right knee, and there are ticket clips on the sun visors. As usual with right-hand drive versions of French cars though, the glove box is halved in size by the fuse box. It really is time that Gallic makers sorted this issue out. Avoid entry-level trim and you get these twin cup holders near the gear stick, behind which is a deep, narrow lidded box between the seats with a lift-out coin tray. 
What else? Uh, well, we don't think many will particularly like this oversized gear knob, and taller drivers might find the pedals placed a little too close for comfort, though there's plenty of seat height and steering column adjustability. The seats are reasonably comfortable and attractively stitched, but it's disappointing that you can't add lumbar support into them unless pricey leather upholstery is specified. Build quality from the Slovakian factory is fine, uh, but this cabin can't quite replicate the sheer solidity of a Volkswagen Group product in this segment. Still, there are nice touches to compensate. The stitching on the front door cards looks classy, and the way that little speakers have been built into the A-pillars is clever. All around visibility isn't bad, but could be better. There are decently sized door mirrors, but the thickness and angle of the windscreen pillars obscure more of what you can see each side at junctions than would be the case in, say, a VW Polo. Plus, the rear C pillar and the tapering roof line also reduce your rear three quarter vision. Fortunately, rear parking sensors are standard across the range. You'll have to have this electronic parking brake on most variants. The manual parking brake lever would prefer is fitted only with base active trim. Time to take a look at the rear seat, which is where things start to unravel a little. Now, there are clear advantages to creating a shared platform that can take both combustion engine and full electric drivetrains, and not only in terms of manufacturing simplicity. For instance, the impetus to deliver the feather-like weight figure that we referenced earlier was primarily driven by the fact that the designers knew that if they didn't, then the battery-powered version was going to end up somewhat overweight. But there are disadvantages too. In the full electric version of this car, you might not mind too much about the prospect of rear bench room being somewhat constrictive if you took into account the need to place the powertrain's battery pack beneath that back seat. But having to accept the same restrictions in a combustion-powered 208 just because it happens to have an electrified relative is less easy to accept. The first sign of this comes when you expect the narrow rear door opening through which you've to pass to access the back of the car, an aperture constricted not just by packaging issues, but also by the relatively low roof height that you've to dodge beneath before gaining entry, which might prove to be a source of irritation if you're particularly tall or if you habitually need to reach into the back to fasten things like child seats. Once inside, it's actually not too bad. There's certainly less room than there was in the previous generation 208, despite the fact that this Mark II model has a fractionally longer wheelbase length. But there's not much less space than you get in the back of a Fiesta, for instance, though that's not really saying much. For some reason, it also feels a fraction more roomy back here than it does in this car's Corsa cousin, though that could be down to the glass house's area feel. To be frank, all three models are somewhat embarrassed in this regard by some supposedly smaller and much cheaper city cars from the class below, like Hyundai's i10. Knee room is about what you'd expect from a modern super mini, and headroom is okay too, though if you specify the optional panoramic cielo glass roof we mentioned earlier, it's slightly compromised by this oddly angled ceiling section. Three adults seated back here would of course have to be on particularly friendly terms. You'd expect that in a super mini, but the wider cabin that you'd get in some rivals, say VW's Polo, would make that eventuality a little easier to bear. Overall, larger adults probably wouldn't want to be spending too long here, but does that matter given that for the majority of buyers these rear seats will be used only occasionally for those above school age? Only you can decide. It certainly helps that the designers have done the best with what they had to work with. The curvature of the front seat backs is designed to improve knee room. Uh, there's a notably low centre transmission tunnel and there's lots of room to poke your feet beneath those front chairs. It seems a bit mean that coat hooks are missing from the grab handles and you don't get any kind of interior light back here unless you go for a top spec model. Also these uh, headrests dig uncomfortably into your back unless you take the trouble to raise them. 
but you do get several things that are lacking in this model's Corsa cousin. Nicely presented stitched door cards, uh, seat back pockets, and on most models, unusually for a car in this class, connectivity ports. From mid-range Allure trim upwards, there are actually two USB ports provided, a standard feature lacking on many luxury cars we test. Finally, let's take a look in the boot, which is 311 litres in size, which is 26 litres more than was on offer in the previous generation model, and 19 litres bigger than the trunk of a Fiesta, but is a capacity figure that remains about average by class standards. Arrival Clio, for instance, gives you a significant 90 litres more, though we didn't find when we tested that Renault that you could actually get that much more in. Uh, in either car, five carry-on cases would be about your limit. Peugeot feels pretty proud that there's no compromise in cargo area size if you go for the battery-powered E208 variant, which must have taken quite a lot of development effort. There's quite a high loading lip, which you notice because there's no adjustable height boot floor to mitigate it, not even as an option. There's no further space beneath the floor, but that's because combustion engine models provide a space saver spare wheel as standard. Floor tie down points have been forgotten, but a single bag hook is provided here on the right. On the left, there's a boot light and an elasticated strap. It's quite a usable squarically sized space though, with 674 millimeters of length and 1018 millimeters of width between the wheel arches. As usual in this class, there's no seat folding cleverness, stuff like adjustable seat back angles for awkwardly shaped loads, a ski hatch or a 40-20-40 rear bench split. you think super mini designers might be building that kind of stuff in by now. So instead, there's just a straightforward 60-40 rear bench split, which once re retracted, reveals 1,106 litres of capacity when you load to the roof. Let's immediately cover off the main things you need to know here. One, five door body style, then four trim levels. Active, this mid-range Allure spec, uh, then the two sportier looking options, GT Lion and Top GT. Now, Peugeot wants you to pick a powertrain in the same way you'd select one of these trim options, whether that be petrol, diesel or electric. From launch, the combustion engine models were priced from just over £16,000, but you're more likely to be spending in the £18,000 to £21,000 bracket for the kind of engine and spec package you'll want, with asking figures for the petrol and diesel models rising up to around £23,500. For the all-electric E208, of course, you'll need quite a bit more. Peugeot obviously thinks it's going to sell quite a few E208s. The prediction is 20% of total model mix. Because this powertrain is available with every trim level, and the top GT spec option is exclusive to it. Even in base active form, though, an E208 will set you back around £25,000. And that's after the available £3,500 government plug-in grant towards purchase has been subtracted from the mildly alarming initial asking price. Most E208 models will be bought on finance, which from launch after grant deduction saw deals starting from around £280 a month with £5,450 up front. Now let's return to what Peugeot calls its thermic models and drill down a bit into engine and transmission choice with those. The bottom line price of just over £16,000 that we quoted earlier at launch, the finance deal on that equated to £229 a month over two years with a £700 deposit. Uh, that'll get you an entry-level 208 with the brand's normally aspirated 75 horsepower PureTech 75 1.2-litre three-cylinder petrol unit. But that variant only comes with a five-speed manual gearbox and the minority interest base active trim level, so relatively few will want it. The volume turbocharged version of this power plant, the Pure Tech 100 petrol unit that we're trying here, costs £1,100 more than the base unit. If you then add on a bit for this mid-range Allure trim package, which gets you the clever 3D i-cockpit dash layout, 
you'll find yourself looking at a starting price of around £19,000 for the kind of car that we're testing today, which comes with a six-speed manual gearbox or the £1,400 option of a rather sophisticated eight-speed EAT8 auto transmission. If you like this engine and you're happy with the idea of an auto, your dealer will suggest that you might also consider this power plant in an uprated auto-only PureTech 130 state of tune, which can be yours for £1,250 more. The alternative to petrol turbo power in this car is Peugeot's usual Blue HDI 100 diesel, which sells for a £1,500 premium over the volume PureTech 100 petrol unit. The brand expects only 5% of 208 buyers to choose it. Enough on the range structure. Let's position this 208 for you within Peugeot's own model lineup before we get into price matching it with Super Minis from other brands. The most obvious alternative to this Super Mini is the crossover model that shares all its engineering, the 2008. But that costs around £2,800 more, which is a substantial premium just to get the same car with more of an SUV-like feel. As for other conventional hatch choices within the Peugeot lineup, well, for around £3,500 less than you'll pay for this 208, there's the company's 108 City Car. Uh, for around £4,000 more than you'd pay for a 208 PureTech 100 model like this one, you could have the brand's slightly bigger 308 family hatch with essentially the same engine. On to the value proposition offered by 208 pricing against rivals from other brands in the Super Mini segment. Now, we'll base our comparisons against the 1.2 turbo petrol 100 horsepower unit that most customers of this Persia will want and start with the three cars that tend to lead the segment in sales terms. Ford's Fiesta, Volkswagen's Polo and, in Europe at least, Renault's Clio. In volume form, this 208 costs 500 to 1,000 pounds more than an equivalent Polo and roughly the same as a comparable Fiesta, but it's typically undercut by Renault's Clio by between 1,500 to 1,800 pounds, though Peugeot argues, rightly, that with comparable spec, the difference in pricing between these two French rivals would be far narrower. It's also very pertinent to consider the pricing of the car this Peugeot shares all its engineering with, the Vauxhall Corsa, which typically costs around £800 less. But what about other options in the Super Mini segment? A strong contender is Seat's Ibiza, which packages up Volkswagen mechanicals more affordably than Apollo does, but at a cost that, by our calculations, would typically save you between £500 to £1,200 over a 208, though the Ibiza feels quite a bit more drab in its cabin. The same comments apply to equivalent versions of the Toyota Yaris, the Kia Rio and the Hyundai i20. Also unremarkable inside is the Skoda Scala, though that car does at least have the advantage of offering a really superb level of interior and boot space. It costs around £500 more than an equivalent 208 though. Now, as you might expect, this car's PSA Group stablemate, Citroen C3, costs around the same as the 208. That's despite the fact that it uses an older PF1 platform uh, than features in a 208, so isn't quite as light and can't be fitted with as advanced a suite of safety equipment. As for other comparably priced Super Mini models, well, you might want to consider either the Mazda 2 or the Honda Jazz. The former, creditable for its infotainment system, the latter for its clever seat folding tech. If you're interested in a Mini 5-door hatch, then a base 1-spec version of one of those would save you around £500 over a base spec PureTech 100 version of this 208. But the Mini would probably end up costing you slightly more once you'd equipped it to a comparable spec. Of course, there are plenty of less expensive Super Minis than this Peugeot in the segment. The Lion brand didn't set out to provide the cheapest offering in this class. Uh, this 208's cabin probably wouldn't have been as nice as it is if it had. Now, the usual suspects feature here, and all require you to accept a much cheaper feeling inside, a smaller boot, and a lower level of technology. Arguably the best of this bunch is Nissan's Micro, which uses Renault engineering and offers a model for model saving of around £2,000. But that car's quite a lot smaller inside and has nothing like as nice a cabin. 
uh, you could save up to around £3,000 over this 208 by going for Skoda's other super mini, the Fabia. And saving would probably be around £3,500 if you uh, considered an equivalent version of the Suzuki Swift or possibly the Mitsubishi Mirage. As for the real budget brands, well, an MG3 would save you around £7,000 and an equivalent Dacia Sandero potentially as much as around £9,000. But with those two cars, you really get what you don't pay for. Finally, a quick word about the value proposition of the battery-powered E208. We mentioned earlier that pricing for this zero emissions variant sat in the £25,000 to £30,000 bracket after government grant deduction, which means it's significantly more affordable than its identically engineered Vauxhall Corsa E equivalent, which in its least expensive form costs around £2,000 more than a base spec active trimmed E208 and in its priciest guise costs around £1,000 more than a top E208 GT. As a rival, a Mini Electric makes even less sense. That Mini's priced from around £28,000 and has a much lower operating range, a three-door only body style and a tiny boot. Plus, it would probably cost around £3,000 more when equipped to a similar standard. There aren't really any other direct all-electric small hatch options. You can get battery-powered versions of the Volkswagen Up, the Seat Mi and the Skoda Citygo from around £20,000, but they're all smaller city cars. A battery-powered family hatch like a Kia e Nero would cost around £5,000 more and a BMW i3 even more. A Renault Zoe is also more expensive. But it's the combustion engine 208 variants that are our focus here. If, having considered the value proposition we've outlined concerning these, you're seduced by this Gallic model style proposition and you then conclude that it is this Persia that you really want, then you're going to want to know just how generous the brand has been when it comes to standard spec. Well, let's see. Even entry-level active variants come pretty well equipped with 16 inch silver Taxim alloy wheels, uh, the rear parking sensors that are lacking on a base Corsa, a Thatcham Category 1 alarm and a reasonable tally of camera safety kit which we'll get to in a moment. Inside in an active spec variant there's air conditioning, a leather stitch steering wheel, a trip computer and programmable cruise control with a speed limiter. Infotainment is taken care of by 7-inch high-definition HD capacitive colour centre dash touchscreen featuring Apple CarPlay, Android Auto smartphone mirroring, Bluetooth and a decent quality 6-speaker DAB audio system. Across the range, 208 buyers get the benefit of the My Peugeot app package that allows you to check data on your car, things like fuel consumption, maintenance or servicing alerts. It can also save the location of your car, remembering where you parked it. The app's homepage gives you essential data like average fuel consumption and mileage. Plus, you can also use the app to look at previous maintenance appointments and to book service visits. The My Peugeot app additionally includes a range of specific services for E208 owners, including remote settings and public charging solutions. Anyway, that covers everything you can expect from a base active trimmed model. But as mentioned earlier, most 208 customers are going to want to buy in a little further up the range. So here, as mentioned earlier, we've gone for the mid-range Allure trim level that many of them will want. These volume variants are recognisable by gloss black finishing on the B pillars and rear bumper, plus dark tinted rear side and tailgate windows and rear full LED 3D signature claw effect tail lamps, along with larger 17 inch wheels of a smart a Jordan diamond cut design. These bigger rims feature on the combustion Allure variants. An Allure trimmed E208 derivative will have 16 inch Elborn alloys. At this level in the range, you also get power folding mirrors and auto wipers. 
Inside, in an Allure spec model, the key inclusion is the 3D iCockpit configurable 3D head-up instrument panel that we fully briefed you on in our design and build section. Plus, you'll find the cabin marked out by the addition of part leather effects seat upholstery, an electrochrome rearview mirror, and automatic climate control functionality for the air conditioning. The addition of an electronic handbrake makes it possible to add two cup holders in the center console too. Plus, at this trim level, you get a storage compartment just behind with an incorporated storage area. In addition, at this level in the range, you also get two USB sockets in the rear. So that covers what you get with the two mainstream trim levels, Active and Allure. It's worth mentioning that both are also available in premium form, which adds in Peugeot's 3D connected navigation system. This works on the 7-inch screen with the Active Premium model or with the larger 10-inch screen with the Allure Premium variant. Quite a few prospective 208 buyers will be tempted by the sportier look of GT line trim. 208 variants of this sort are recognisable by their diamond black roof finishing, gloss black wheel arch extensions, the gloss black diffuser effect trim for the lower part of the rear bumper, their nearer black door mirror caps and the dark chrome and checkered trim for the front grille with its gloss black edging. As for wheels, well, 17-inch two-tone diamond cut alloy rims feature at this level in the range in a shore style with the E208 variant or in a Camden design with the combustion engine models which also feature twin chromed exhaust pipes. You have to stretch right up to this level in the range to get the full LED headlights that are standard right across the Vauxhall Corsa lineup, but the ones on a 208 look quite a bit funkier with a distinctive signature three claw tooth design. Plus, they feature smart beam assist, which means that they dip themselves automatically at night. Inside, in a 208 GT Line model, you're treated to eight color personalizable ambient lighting lime green interior stitching that also features on seats upholstered in a tri-material combination of cozy faux leather and isabella cloth there's also a higher quality mistral perforated leather steering wheel a frameless rearview mirror front parking sensors and a visio park 180 degree color reversing camera that only leaves top GT spec, which, as we said earlier, is exclusively reserved for E208 buyers. Now, this is the only trim level in the range that gets the larger 10-inch center dash touchscreen as standard, a display that comes complete with the brand's excellent connected 3D navigation package, which indicates traffic conditions and risk zones in real time, and includes a three-year subscription to the TomTom Live Services package. GT buyers also get part Alcantara upholstery, front heated seats and gloss black plating for the toggle switches beneath the central touchscreen. Uh, there's also an extra level of automated driving assistance at this level, a parking assistance feature that steers you into spaces and adaptive cruise control with a stop and go function, plus a few extra camera safety features we'll cover off in a minute. Right, enough with all the standard features fitted across the various trim levels. What about options? Well, there are actually very few, because Peugeot would like buyers wanting to embellish things a bit to simply progress another level or two up the trim hierarchy. There are a few key options, though. The most common one we think uh, 208 buyers will want is the connected 3D navigation system, which is available on Allure and GT Line variants and costs £650 more, a sum that includes an upgrade to the larger 10-inch centre dash screen. If you do add in this 10-inch screen to an Allure or GT Line model, you'll have to pay extra to have the piano key buttons beneath it trimmed in the usual gloss black finish. What else? Well, avoid uh, entry trim level, and you'll be able to specify the expensive option of full grain leather upholstery into your 208, complete with powered seat adjustment and a seat massage function. Annoyingly, you have to choose this pricey option if you're to get seat lumbar support in this car. On a GT Line variant, you can add in that park assist system to steer you into spaces and the Cielo panoramic glass roof. 
avoid entry-level trim and you'll be able to buy a subscription to TomTom Tom Live services to upgrade your car's infotainment capabilities. A speed cam danger zones subscription is available too. Bear in mind that like most brands these days, Peugeot penalises you on paint choice. Unless you choose the single solid standard colour, Faro Yellow, then you'll have to pay your dealer extra for your choice of shade, even if you go for the rather basic solid Bianca White shade that can't be had on an E208. You're probably more likely though to want one of the various metallic shades. We've got Nera Black here, or maybe one of the three special pearlescent paint colours that really suit this car, uh, possibly pearlescent white, but we'd be more tempted by Elixir Red or the eye-catching triple coat vertigo blue finish. Finally, a word about the E208. Uh, we find it annoying that Peugeot refuses to supply a three-pin charging leader standard with this EV variant, but wants instead to get you to pay nearly £500 more for it. Yes, of course, you'd ideally never want to plug in to a domestic supply with such a thing, but in operating an E208, there might be times during which you'd have to, say when staying at a friend's house or a B&B overnight. At such times, a three-pin plug lead would be essential. See if you can get your dealer to throw it in as part of the deal, is our advice. Let's finish with a look at safety. Now, you'd expect a modern super mini these days to come with some sort of autonomous braking system fitted as standard across the range, and this 208 doesn't disappoint. The active safety brake system is standard fit and it works at speeds between 3 and 53 miles an hour, scanning the road ahead in search of potential collision hazards. If one is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, then at speeds of below 90 miles an hour, your 208 will autonomously brake itself to a complete stop with 0.9 g of braking, avoiding the obstacle. At speeds of between 19 and 53 miles an hour, speed will be reduced by up to 14 miles an hour. In its standard form, the system can specifically identify vehicles and pedestrians, but only in daylight. Other standard safety features include lane keeping assist with road edge detection, which alerts you if you drift out of your lane and applies subtle corrective lock to steer you back to where you ought to be. Like the active safety brake setup, we found that this feature works smoothly and unobtrusively with a refreshing lack of too many jerks, beeps and bongs. Uh, what else is standard in terms of safety camera kit? Uh, well, there's a driver attention warning which works at speeds upwards of 40 miles an hour and monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness, which if detected will prompt a warning to stop for a restorative coffee. Plus, it'll automatically warn you to take a break if you've been driving for more than a couple of hours. There's also traffic signs recognition, which pictures speed signs as you pass, then displaying them on the dash, and can even recognise stop and no entry signs. Uh, buyers also get the brand's Peugeot Connect and SOS system built into the car, which will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact GPS location in an accident. More usual safety inclusions that of course feature here include Isofix child seat fastenings on the outer rear seats, a tyre pressure monitoring system, hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions and twin front side and curtain airbags. Though unfortunately there's no driver's knee airbag. Plus of course all the usual electronic assistance for stability and traction control. Uh, there's cornering brake control for extra stability through the turns and a drag torque control feature that stops destabilisation of the car that would otherwise occur if you were to suddenly lift off the throttle or change down into too low a gear on a slippery road. If you want more in terms of safety kit, then you'll need to shop further up the range or pay a bit more. With GT Line variants, the active safety brake setup is upgraded to be able to work at night and specifically detect cyclists. Plus, as mentioned earlier, you get smart beam assistance that automatically dips your headlights for you at night. The top E208 GT model builds on this with active blind spot monitoring that alerts you if you're about to dangerously pull out when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. 
the GT model's capabilities are further built upon with a modest level of Level 2 style driving autonomy. Peugeot's approach to this is similar to the kind of thing that you'll find on top versions of the rival Renault Clio, using an adaptive cruise control system with an integrated stop and go function, which, if you come across a tailback, will automatically slow you down to a stop and start you off again when the traffic moves. This setup works in conjunction with lane positioning assist, which centers the car in the middle of the roadway lane, which means that with these two features working on a long highway trip, virtually all the steering, braking and throttle work would be done for you. On a GT Line manual variant, you can add in uh, adaptive cruise control as an option. On a GT Line automatic model, you can option in the full semi-autonomous driving package that we've just described to you. Uh, lane positioning assist, along with adaptive cruise control incorporating stop and go. Not many super minis these days can weigh in at less than a tonne, but this is one of them. The 980 kilogram curb weight figure of an entry level 208 model being a full 30 kilograms lighter than was the case with the previous generation design. A weight reduction roughly equivalent to the saving you'd make if you were to ask a teenage passenger to get out and walk. The use here of the PSA Group's latest CMP platform contributes most towards this reduction, as you might expect it would. But the Peugeot design team also had to do quite a lot else to achieve it, replacing a steel bonnet with an aluminium one, redesigning the seats and making significant savings in the body and white structure. Given all this effort, it's actually a fraction disappointing to find the fuel and CO2 readings of this car not to be class leading across the board, but they're still extremely good. With the PureTech 100 petrol unit most will choose, you're looking at up to 53.0 miles to the gallon on the WLTP combined cycle and up to 96 grams per kilometre of NEDC rated CO2. That's if you opt for a manual gearbox. With the 8-speed auto, the figures are 50.3 miles to the gallon and 97 grams per kilometre. To give you some class perspective, a rival Ford Fiesta 1 litre EcoBoost 95 PS model does fractionally better, while a directly comparable Renault Clio TCE 100 is marginally more frugal, but also marginally dirtier. A 1 litre TSI 95 PS Volkswagen Polo, though, can't quite match this showing, recording 50.4 miles to the gallon and 105 grams per kilometre. If you want to stretch to a 208 fitted with the uprated 130 horsepower version of this PureTech petrol turbo unit, which has to be mated with auto transmission, then the figures are up to 51.9 miles to the gallon on the WLTP combined cycle and 101 grams per kilometre of NEDC rated CO2. If you'd rather stick with a 208 powered by the normally aspirated 75 horsepower version of this 1.2 litre petrol engine, then the figures are up to 53.6 miles to the gallon on the combined WLTP cycle and up to 93 grams per kilometre of CO2. That latter NEDC rated figure being 10 to 15 percent better than you get from entry level petrol versions of the Fiesta, Clio and Polo models just mentioned. This kind of strong efficiency showing is as much about engine technology as it is about lightweight of course and the three cylinder petrol units have been developed with an emphasis on minimizing mechanical losses due to friction. Switch your attention to the 208 Blue HDI 100 diesel variant and the opposition melts away a bit thanks to official figures suggesting that a WLTP rated combined cycle fuel return of up to 71.4 miles to the gallon is possible along with any DC rated emissions of up to 84 grams per kilometre. Readings that are way better than those of any other diesel super mini in this segment bar of course the PSA group models that share the same engine, the Vauxhall Corsa Turbo D and the blue HDI 100 version of the Citroen C3. The PSA people certainly seem to have a lead in diesel technology. Their black pump fueled units featuring a clever three step after treatment system designed to better eliminate the four nasty pollutants that diesel units usually put out, namely unburnt hydrocarbons, carbon mon monoxide, nitrogen oxides and particulates. 
The first stage sees the unwanted hydrocarbon and carbon monoxide elements converted into harmless water and carbon dioxide. In the second stage, that nasty nitrogen oxide also gets converted into water via a selective catalytic reduction process using the urea and water mixture AdBlue, which you'll need to get topped up every 12 and a half thousand miles. Finally, in the third step, a particulate emissions filter eliminates virtually all particulates at a stroke. For some though, thinking about fuel consumption and smoky emissions will all be very yesteryear in these days of melting polar ice caps. It's for these people that the battery powered E208 full electric version of this car has been developed with its 50 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery and 100 kilowatt electric motor. Peugeot's aim was for this EV to have a total ownership cost roughly equivalent to what you'd pay to buy and run an automatic version of the petrol model. Well, it's some way off that right at present. Its drivetrain claims to be state-of-the-art for a small car, though its WLTP certified range of 211 miles is bettered in the class by the BMW i3, which records up to 223 miles, and the Renault Zoe, which in 52 kilowatt hour form manages up to 242 miles. It's worth pointing out, though, that both these rivals cost significantly more, the BMW particularly so, and that a more closely priced zero emission rival, the Mini Electric, can offer a WLTP range of only 144 miles. Bear in mind that, as with all EVs, the quoted range figure will drop considerably in winter weather or over long motorway journeys, in the case of the E208 to around 150 miles. Now, if you're an E208 owner, you'll need to know that getting anywhere near the quoted range figure will necessitate staying in the powertrain's provided eco mode. Activating its sport mode setting will reduce your range by around 10%. What about charging times? As an EV owner, it goes without saying that you'll need off-street parking and you'll need to get a wall box installed in your garage. At the time of this test in early 2020, the cost of that was £856 excluding VAT, though £500 of that will be covered by the available government grant. With the wall box in place, a full charge from empty will take seven and a half hours. If your property happens to have a three-phase electricity supply and you pay extra to have your E208 standard 7.4 kilowatt onboard charger upgraded to 11 kilowatt spec, that charging time can be reduced to just five hours. Don't bother with the 11 kilowatt onboard charger upgrade if you haven't got a three phase power supply at home. With a normal electricity supply, an E208 with that 11 kilowatt onboard charger would actually take longer to charge. Charging cost effectively will require proactive use of the charging timer so uh, that you can tap into off peak electricity rates. You can activate this either via the car's center dash screen or via a special section of the My Peugeot app. Uh, the charging timer will also be useful for preconditioning the cabin of the car before you get into it. This will mean that you won't have to use valuable battery energy warming or cooling the cabin when you get in. At the launch of this Peugeot EV, and at the time of this test in early 2020, Graham was offering buyers a free six-month subscription to the Polar Public Charging Network, the UK's largest. Finding public chargers of any sort ought to be pretty straightforward. The TomTom navigation system will show them, or you can get more detail by bringing up the specialist ZapMap website on the centre dash screen via the car's standard Apple CarPlay Android Auto smartphone mirroring system. With a public 50 kilowatt rapid charger, the replenishment time to charge from 15 to 80 percent is 45 minutes. If you're fortunate enough to find a 100 kilowatt rapid charger, that falls to 30 minutes. If the charger in question is a 22 kilowatt accelerated public charger, then the replenishment time will vary depending on whether you paid a little extra to get that upgraded 11 kilowatt onboard charger that we just mentioned. If you do that, you can reduce the five hour replenishment time with this kind of charger to three hours and 20 minutes. At the other extreme, if you happen to be somewhere you can only charge from a domestic supply using an ordinary three pin plug and the optional three pin plug lead that costs extra with this car, then the charging replenishment time would be a yawning 20 hours. 
as an E208 buyer, your dealer will also give you the option to pay a subscription for a so-called mobility pass. That'll enable you to borrow a conventional petrol or diesel-powered Peugeot from the brand for those times when you might need to undertake a longer or more complex journey. Holiday times, for instance. What else might you need to know? Well, we'll switch back to the combustion engine models that are our primary focus in this test and tell you that there's the usual stop-start system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Uh, as a 208 owner, you can download a useful My Peugeot app via which you can take care of your Peugeot online and book maintenance visits, which, by the way, will be needed every year or 12,000 miles for petrol engines and every year or 20,000 miles for the diesel unit. There are, of course, plenty of Peugeot outlets to choose from, so you should never be too far from one. On that subject, at point of purchase, you can get a prepaid Peugeot servicing plan for a relatively small monthly payment over three years. This will cover you for three services and an MOT, plus it'll give you three years of roadside assistance. Insurance ratings are reasonably comparable with other mainstream brand models in this segment. You're looking at a Group 12E rating for the base 1.275 horsepower petrol unit and Group 19E or 20E for the volume 1.2 litre 100 horsepower petrol engine. It's 24E or 25E for the PureTech 130 models uh, and 21E or 22E for the diesel version. For the E208, it's Group 26E for active trim, 27E for allure spec or Group 2080 for GT line or GT trim. Residual values across the 208 range are stronger than they used to be, a little better than you get from a Fiesta but not quite as good as would be managed by a well looked after Renault Clio. Finally, you'll also need to know about warranties. In a class where Hyundai and Toyota offer standard five-year warranties and Kia offers a seven-year package, uh, Peugeot, like most of its other rivals, persists with the usual three-year 60,000-mile package, which can be extended up to five years and 100,000 miles at extra cost. A year's free breakdown cover is also provided, along with a six-year anti-corrosion guarantee. On an E208, the battery is covered by a separate 8-year 100,000 mile warranty to 70% of its charge capacity. So how successful has Peugeot been with this second generation 208 in terms of what it describes as unboring the future? Well, we think you'll be impressed. The future will surely hold a great deal more sophistication for super mini buyers than this, but in comparison to what's currently on offer, this car seems like a generation ahead of most of its rivals. Not everyone, of course, will like the trendy looks and fashion-conscious cabin, but as a previous Peugeot managing director liked to remark, it's okay to have 20% of people not liking this car as long as the other 80% love it. On that basis, we think the company might not have too much to worry about. Previous to this second generation 208 model's arrival, there were essentially three kinds of super mini buyer. Those prioritizing quality, who picked a Volkswagen Polo or something like it. Those wanting sharp drive dynamics, who chose a Ford Fiesta or something like it and those with no fixed priorities who simply wanted the best small B-segment hatch they could get for the lowest possible outlay. This car opens up a fourth way with a design-led appeal that offers something refreshingly different in the class. And if you're the kind of person who appreciates that sort of thing, then nothing else in this segment will satisfy you in quite the same way. Given all of this, it goes without saying that if you don't quite fit into the buying demographic the brand has in mind, you may conceivably still want to shop elsewhere. The 208 doesn't have the hewn from granite quality of a polo or the handling joie de vivre of a Fiesta, and it's also one of the pricier cars in the class. Not everyone likes the i-cockpit cabin layout. The fact that the climate controls aren't separated out from the central touchscreen is just annoying, and you'll find other Superminis with more rear seat room and larger boots. 
Even those not immediately seduced by this little Peugeot's charms, though, might find their super mini shortlist refreshed in no small measure by the inclusion of one of these. And it has virtues that surely everyone would appreciate. Impressive efficiency, uh, a supple ride, decent refinement, a likeable range of engines, and the useful option of a full electric variant should you want that. In summary, trying to please too many people too much of the time is a surefire recipe for failure, or at the very least a distinctly compromised and forgettable end result. As Peugeot now knows, a bolder, more innovative brand these days, the kind of maker you'd need to be to create a little hatch as good as this one. In this 208, the company has finally bought us the super mini it was always capable of. A smart small car choice in more ways than one.